Um, here we go. So five, four, three, two, and one. Our right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. Very excited to have as my guest today, Rob Morris. Rob, welcome. Great to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. So Rob is a co-founder and CEO of COCO, whose mission is to combat the youth mental health crisis by meeting young people where they're at online. Rob's journey with Coco began during his graduate studies at MIT, a period marked by personal struggles with mental health. It was out of this challenging experience that the seeds of Coco were planted. Uh, Rob, again, thanks for being here. Before we get going, share with our listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Yeah, I grew up in the uh, Bay Area in Silicon Valley and kind of the heart, beating heart of, of technology. Um, interestingly, I had nothing to do with it when I was a kid. I didn't want to be part of it at all. I was kind of a bookish person. Um, fast forward you know, 30 years or so, and, and now I'm deep in the heart of technology. Um, I'm right outside of San Francisco. Okay, awesome. So let's let's dive into this. You, I love what you guys are doing. Your, your story is, um, what's the word? Incredible, maybe? Uh, but amazing, really inspiring. How did this start for you? Yeah, so I've struggled with depression all my life. Uh, my first episode was when I was quite young. And I've had them every couple of years. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have uh, elevated mood periods. I'm on the bipolar spectrum. Um, but all of this personal experience led me to pursue a career in psychology. So I did my undergraduate work in psychology at Princeton and then did some postgraduate work in Boston. My intention was then to go and do a PhD in clinical neuroscience. But every time I showed up to office hours with my advisors, I would always come bringing some weird gadget. I would bring something you could wear on your wrist that would detect your heartbeat or your skin conductance. Um, all these things that kind of predated Fitbit and, and those devices. And they said, oh, okay, we're going to send you off to MIT. And that's where my, my career really got started. So, okay. So initially, because of what you were experiencing, your depression, you said, I want to learn more about this and get into psychology. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... <laughs> why were you showing up with these things on your wrist and so <laughs> forth just for your own edification? And yeah, I think there was an engineer hiding inside me this whole time. I was never very math focused. I, I was always kind of looking for a, a literature degree. I majored in psychology, but I think there's a designer and an engineer that just needed to come out. Um, and I really wanted to pursue interventions that actually help people. I was too impatient to spend six years studying some subnuclei of the amygdala that would hopefully generate knowledge that could help inform clinical interventions years and years down the line. I wanted to build things that I could put in the hands of real people as quickly as possible. All right, let's go back just a little bit. So when did you first realize that something was going on, i.e. depression or uh, anything mm -hmm. else? Yeah, it, it started for me when I was really young. I think my first episode was maybe nine or 10. And of course, at that age, I had no vocabulary for that. I just remembered a, an overwhelming, enveloping darkness covering covering me. I found it hard to speak or move. Things that I would normally enjoy um weren't bringing me any happiness so i've i kind of had that experience but it took a while um for me to present it as such to my parents and and get help in a meaningful way were there others in your family who were experiencing similar things yeah depression definitely runs through my my family line for sure okay so you tell your parents what's going on what happens next so I think it took about, um, took a while. I was in maybe middle school, early high school when we decided to do a more thorough neuropsych evaluation um, just to rule out all sorts of things. Um, I think what, what's interesting is it took a long time for 
me to realize that I was more on the bipolar spectrum. So typical SSRIs, which I was prescribed, weren't effective. In fact, mm. they made me pretty agitated. And because I never had a, a manic phase, I had elevated mood, periods of creativity, hyperproductivity. I just felt like that was a kind of normal fluctuation in human experience. Um, so it took a while before that that diagnosis um, to emerge for me. But once it did, it was very helpful. Okay. So were you seeing therapists at any point? Yeah, I started seeing therapists in, in college and I've pretty continually seen them since okay. then. Okay. Okay. So from what, also from what it sounds like your interest in what you were going to do professionally kind of shifted a little bit um, from maybe doing research to actually quote unquote, helping people in a more, what, tangible way, immediate mm -hmm. way. How did mm -hmm. that manifest for you? What did, what did you start to do? Yeah. So when I came to MIT, the first work I pursued was building assistive technologies for people on the autism spectrum. So I was really focused on that population. I was looking at building tools to help individuals manage sound sensitivity in particular, which is often overlooked um, a problem area for people on the spectrum. But meanwhile, I was still struggling tremendously with my own mental health. I was very fortunate to have university health services, but even then wait lists were long. It was hard to find mm. time to get appointments. So I did what any uh, good MIT student would do, which is I started hacking together some solutions for myself. And I started to build a, a digital self-help uh, platform that could kind of help me during those inter interim phases between seeing a uh, therapist. Okay. Now, when you say you were struggling, what did, what did that look like for you? What did that mean for you? Yeah. Um, at MIT, it was, it was quite hard for me because I joined with a, with a psychology background as we discussed, and I didn't have any formal training in math or engineering or computer science. So I don't recommend going to MIT without that kind of prerequisite knowledge. Which is so what I... people associate <laughs> with MIT, right? Yeah, I, I well, think most I, commonly. Yeah, I I ended up in a lab that really needed this kind of dual expertise: a, a builder and someone with a deep fundamental research psychology training. Um, so that's that's how I ended up there, and. Yeah, I, it was really hard. I had to teach myself how to code um, while sitting in a small cramped office space with classmates who'd been taking apart computers since they were six oh years old. Um, so, you know, I, I even attended the undergrad classes to try and um, keep up and those were incredibly difficult for me. So I had a lot of negative thoughts, distorted thoughts about not being well suited for MIT, failing, um, dropping out, not knowing what what could happen, just kind of the typical catastrophic thinking pattern that, that can happen. Now, let me ask you something uh, personal here. And of course, you know, feel free to answer you know, whatever you want and in whatever de depth you feel comfortable. But was there a point at which you were suicidal at all? I've had suicidal ideation for sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you're struggling you're in these classes and you said you began to develop something to help yourself. Talk more about that. What did that look like? <laughs> okay. So as a novice computer programmer, there was one website that saved me. It was called Stack Overflow. And it's basically a website where you can go and you can describe any problem you're having with your code. So if my code's not working, I can post on it. And magically, all these humans for free will come in and help me fix my code. It's kind of a beautiful era of the internet where you could leverage collective intelligence in a really uh, productive and non-toxic way. Um, as I was doing this, though, the problems weren't so much the bugs in my code, but rather the bugs in my thinking about mm -hmm. how I was coding. So, you know, I, I can't write this code, it's not working, I'm terrible. Um, so I wanted to build a stack overflow for the mind, essentially, a way to leverage- a Crowdsource. Crowdsourced version, you know, a loosely designed crowdsourced version of cognitive therapy. Um, wow. So 
you know, I, I've been doing all sorts of different therapeutic modalities for myself over the years. Um, I think CBT was pretty big for me in that era. And what I found frustrating with um, doing thought records and those kinds of things was when my mind and my mood were stressed, my brain's ability to think flexibly and creatively was impaired. So it made it really difficult to think about how to reframe a negative situation. And I was building this platform where, you know, strangers on the internet would come through and look at whatever I was describing as a negative thought, and they could help me uh, find distortions in my thinking or reframe it. And they weren't trained therapists. I gave them just, you know, one little task, like, hey, is this something like all or nothing thinking? Here's how we define that. And, you know, I'd have like 10 people respond to me in different ways. Um, it was super compelling. Uh, my classmates started using it and it started wow. to blossom into a, a, a more uh, fully fledged platform. But the thing that was really exciting was when people were helping me, I, I would often give them the option to give me feedback on you know, what I was asking them to do. And people would say, hey, doing this exercise actually helped me. Helping you was helping me. And so we re redesigned the platform. So it was completely bi-directional. So while I'm getting help from a crowd, I was incentivizing myself to go help other people. And I found mm -hmm. that that actually was more therapeutic, more beneficial. And, you know, years later, we've, we have empirical um, data and research papers to support that idea. Um, so that's when it really gathered steam when, when we started to find ways to leverage the power of helping others to help yourself. So help me understand what this platform looked like. Was it like a journal type thing? You would go online and just type what was going on for you and you would ask people, you know, this is what I'm, what's happening. Can you help me or what? Yeah, essentially, essentially that, um, it was frankly way over complicated, um, at, <laughs> at, at the start, <laughs> um, it, it's since evolved into something quite a bit different, which we can talk about, but it was basically writing a small, a short thought record. So describing a situation and your negative thoughts that accompany it. And it was character count constrained. So, you know, you can't write like a five paragraph essay, which would overwhelm anyone trying to respond to it. Right. And then you get messages and, and the people who were responding were responding with a very simple task. They weren't kind of faced with this paragraph of text and, and asked to just do their best. We would have very specific tasks that they could work on um, for for each each block of text they were approaching. And you put it online. How? What does that mean when you put it online? How did people find this? Yeah, so that's an interesting story. It's always really hard to bootstrap platforms like this. Like, how do you get a supply of people willing and interested in, in doing this. To start, I used a service on Amazon um, that allowed me to pay people for doing really small online jobs. A lot of that platform was used um, to help label images, clean up data. So I was using it in a very atypical way. So someone working on this Amazon platform would make some you know, spare, spare money, um, just doing random things like labeling images or cleaning up data. And then all of a sudden they see this task that's like, here's a, here's a small um, uh, uh, post from a grad student who's saying like they're struggling with their relationship. Um, here's, here's what we want you to do. There's something, I mean, one of the things that's so interesting to me about what, this, Rob, is there's the obvious component of ingenuity um, and the technical aspect uh, that's required here. But on the other side of that is there's, I mean, it takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there. How did you have any hesitation in that? Or were you oh, like, yeah. I need freaking help. This, I got to do this. <laughs> There's a little, little bit of both. I think what was really interesting was there wasn't just the nerves and anxiety related to putting myself out there and disclosing things for anonymous anonymous group of strangers to respond to and and all of that but there was this other element of 
the quality and nature of the responses was relevant to what I was building. So if the output that came back wasn't working right, um, then I would then I would have a, another wave of of stress wash over me. So mm. at some point, a lot of my posts um, into the system were very meta. I would say I'm trying to build this platform where people come and help each other think more hopefully about the world that's not working because this and this, it's going to be a failure. I've wasted all this time. And so I'd use the very platform I was stressed out about to help manage the stress about building the platform. So how did this evolve? Let's, let's bring mm-hmm. us up to date in a sense. Yeah. So eventually it evolved into a clinical trial. So uh, we partnered with Northwestern um, and MIT, um, had a lot of support from advisors at uh, Harvard and Stanford. And we ran a randomized controlled trial where we randomly assigned people to use this platform I had built or to do a therapeutic expressive writing. So it was a really nicely designed study because everything looked the same. The platform mm-hmm. looked the same, the logo looked the same, except in one case, you're just writing and journaling. In the other case, you're writing and journaling, but you have this crowdsourced cognitive reappraisal and this um, ability to help other people. And so we're looking at the difference between those two after about three weeks of usage and and looking and monitoring uh, changes in depression symptoms over time. And, and we had a few other outcome measures. It's about 10 years ago, so I don't remember all of them. Um, but we did that. We had about 166 people in that um, trial. And we found uh, the platform outperformed the control or the, the active control task on all measures. And more interesting, we found people were really engaged. They, they loved this social um, way to engage with these kinds of coping skills and strategies. And we ended up having a couple people from that trial stay on the platform for several years later, um, still very, very active in our community and, and using it. Um, since then, we've evolved the platform a fair bit, but it went from 166 people to now reaching over 5 million people. Wow. So initially, where did you get the respondents like who yep. are they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I like any study done in Boston, it was uh, universities in that area mostly. Um, but we also posted on Craigslist. So I think we had a variety of ages, but it wasn't the target age that Coco eventually um, grew to target um, over time. So it was more um, college age students, um, some middle aged folks as well. And the the instruction to them was what? Gosh. Um, well, just generally, this, you're going to be reading X type of text, respond however you like, or because in as you're talking, in one sense, it almost sounds like a microcosm of social media, where mm-hmm. sometimes people put themselves out there. But, you know, we all know, sometimes there's a lot of hate comes back, right? Yeah. Obviously, mm-hmm. you're not expressing that at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were, there were a lot of ways we managed all of those. Um, we would train people kind of on the fly to do simple, simple jobs, um, as I described. Um, and then everything was moderated. So at that time, we had multiple humans reviewing every piece of text that was created and before it was surfaced on the platform. So here we are, 2024. You said there's a huge amount of people now on the platform. Talk to us about Coco. What does it do? How do people come? Who are you helping? Yeah, so it's it's evolved quite a bit. Um, there There's still this community moderated social support platform that functions pretty similarly to, to what I built at MIT, but we also have what we call single session interventions. These are self-guided, short interventions that te- teach uh, coping skills related to self-harm, uh, body image, that kind of thing. And we also have a crisis triage component. So anyone coming on, we we simply ask, um, you know, how are you doing? What are you struggling with? And we're able to identify people who are struggling with suicidal thoughts or self-harm or disordered eating. 
and route them to uh, various resources. I think okay. the thing that is most different is how we reach people. And, and this is I, the biggest innovation um, we pursued over the last um, you know, eight years or so. Um, as uh, and we continue to do now as a nonprofit entity. So when I was scaling this and building it for more and more people, one of the things I would do is I would try to interview people and talk to as many people as possible. And the most convenient way for me to do that at the time was to simply go on platforms like Twitter and search, I feel depressed or I'm depressed or I can't get an appointment with my therapist. And I'd be able to find people posting that and, and kind of ask them, hey, would you mind talking to me a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, so I'd try to see you know, if we could design this platform to, to help those individuals. But what was really clear to me was there's a huge opportunity to bring digital interventions directly into platforms people use every day. Um, so rather than you know hiding something in an app store, which is really hard to find, can we find ways to service these types of interventions directly to people on the platforms and ideally at the moments they, they most need them? So over the years, we started partnering with some of these platforms and the way it looks today, if you imagine a young person, you know, maybe they're 15 and they go on a social media platform and they search for, let's say, pro-anorexia. Um, they might see videos of young people starving themselves, sharing dangerous weight loss strategies. We're trying to flip this around. So if you imagine that same person searching for this, we help the platforms identify those videos, that harmful content, and we help suppress that so they don't see it. Mm -hmm. And then we divert that person to uh, our resources online. So that same person, instead of going down a rabbit hole and seeing more and more videos and having something that started as a concern, transition into a crisis to a life-saving, a life-threatening situation, can we quickly redirect them to resources related to eating disorder um, through that handoff? So let's say the, that person, the young person comes to Coco um, specifically, what are they going to do when they go online? And you talked about the triage. Let's say they're not mm -hmm. suicidal, so they're not going down there. But yeah. where where do they go? I want to get a clearer picture of what it looks like when someone comes to your site. Yeah, it, it really depends. So we do have a higher risk bucket, as we described. And we've done a lot of innovation with research partners at Harvard and elsewhere to really understand how can we get someone who is at high risk to actually utilize lifelines and, and help services like that. So we spend a lot of time innovating in, in that regard. Um, then for the, the remaining population, it, it kind of depends. If someone's struggling with disordered eating, we will certainly send them to NIDA or other resources um, in the US, but we also have um, self-guided courses they can take um, that maybe help them uh, with body image perception or other other kinds of issues. And then another set of people can access our um, peer support, which is essentially that very constrained, precision-based, um, crowdsourced cognitive therapy, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a lot more simple now. It's really a place where people can help each other feel more hopeful about the so what does that look like specifically? So let's say they go online and are they are they prompted to tell people what's going on? What does that look like? Yeah. Um, so if they go down that branch, we ask them, you know, hey, what are you struggling with? And it's it's character count constrained. We we use various AI um, technologies to help understand, you know, is this a high risk situation? Are, are they talking about something specific? Or is this kind of everyday depression, anxiety, school stress, that kind of thing? Um, if it's the latter, um, after they make a post, assuming that it passes all our moderation checks, um, they'll get a message that says, okay, you know, the, the community is taking a look. While you wait, why don't you try helping other people? Mm. And they go down mm. that flow. And what's beautiful about that is most people go on to help multiple other people. 
So if you have one person coming in and asking for help, they go in to help two or three other people. Wow, we now cool. have this beautiful situation where our network is balanced. I don't know of any other crisis line or peer support line where there's not a problem with supply. We never have that problem. If we get 10,000 people in an hour, all of our performance metrics go up. The time to response gets faster, outcomes get better. So it's it's really all, that whole part of our platform is all hinged around this idea of empowering people to help help each other. You talk a little bit about uh, the work you're doing to reach kids. No, I say kids, who are your, your, your target audience in a sense? We are 13 and up and the average age is 15.7. Uh, last time we checked, we, we collect no personal data whatsoever. Um, people are basically a random user ID on our platform. We don't know where they are in the world. We don't have IP address, username, email. So we do have to ask them these questions. And we usually do that in the context of a research study. So mm -hmm. our platform might say, hey, do you want to participate in a study with Northwestern? They go off the platform and that's when we can get that kind of demographic information related to age, gender, sexual identity, race, ethnicity, um, all those, all those variables. And just, I know we're kind of winding down here, but how are you getting these kids? I mean, more specifically, I mean, this kind of, that age is kind of notorious mm -hmm. for not wanting to talk, but obviously <laughs> this is, this is anonymous, but how are you reaching those kids? Yeah, it, it's always been amazing to me how engaged kids are on this platform. We have the direct undivided attention of young people, which is like the most rare element in the universe. And um, they're getting help. Um, they want to engage in this type of content. Now, of course, we spend a lot of time doing user research and talking to young people to adapt and refine our services so they meet them on their level but ever since i started doing this i've I've always been surprised at how willing young people are to start um, exploring these types of services online so are they are they are you reaching them through ads are you reaching them just mm -hmm. online through specific avenues or, or what it, it really depends it's different for every platform but we try to reach them on platforms like Discord and TikTok and Tumblr. And we're partnered with Giphy, of all things, too. If you're searching for different GIFs, um, we'll come up. And it it kind of depends on um, if they're looking for content that suggests they, they might need some mental health support. Um, we also get generous funding from the platforms themselves, which allow us to serve ads. Um, we are nonprofit, so everything is free and we don't have any business models that, you know, incentivize us to um, retain people or collect information or data. Um, so we're able to get these really nice partnerships with the platforms as well. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Rob, uh, the website or the, the name of what you're doing is Coco. What's the best way for people to learn more about that? Yeah, our website you. is www cococares.org okay and there's, there's a try now button you can try our services there and uh we're really excited um to be partnering with the uh, coco gorilla foundation pretty soon here um our name was not inspired by the gorilla directly but uh keep an keep an eye out for that um for some great wonderful gorilla themed <laughs> interventions awesome awesome yeah. rob super inspiring man I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting this out there Therapists obviously listen to this, people in the mental health space. And I think this is uh, really something uh, that they can offer to their clients. And uh, hopefully, yeah, I definitely, I definitely know therapists who, who use it. I think um, there are all sorts of opportunities to weave this into different yeah. therapeutic experiences. Well, look, thanks for joining me. I'd uh, love to have you back at a later date. Appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, man. Take care.